God, we thank you for the hearing of your word today. And Lord, the longer I am a Christian, Lord, the less I feel like I understand of you because you keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And Lord, today you, uh, in, in the reading of this word, Father, in the hearing of this word, show yourself for who you are and us for who we are. So Lord, would you continue to magnify yourself before us that all things lesser than you would be in their rightful place and you alone on your throne. So Lord, work through right now uh, whatever means you desire to change us, to convict us, to empower us, to equip us uh, for service to you this week. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, praise God for those songs. Thank you, Dick and Patton, for selecting those for us and really tie right into the thing that we're going to be talking about today. So we'll be in Joshua chapter 6, as uh, Dad just read this morning. Um, and if, you, if you've not been here for any of, the, uh, le- uh, any of the by faith lessons, this is, I think, our eighth lesson. We have two more, and then we'll start a brand new fall series, okay? And so uh, Hebrews 12, verse 1 says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with endurance the race marked out for us. So this uh, particular series this summer has just been intended really to give us encouragement by looking at different characters and different stories of faith uh, mentioned particularly in Hebrews. So today we come to the story of Jericho. And uh, I, want, I want us to see four things, and these four things are in your bulletin, okay? Number one, I want us to talk about understanding the why of Jericho, understanding the significance of Jericho, understanding the two vistas of Jericho, and then lastly, understanding the application of Jericho. All right, I hope you have a pen and a paper. Uh, we like to take notes in uh, kind of a learning church, so... Here we go. Understanding the why of Jericho. So if you, if you were you know, reading the Bible for the first time and you came across this story, and particularly that last verse, you'd probably be like, uh, what is God doing? He commands the entire city, men, women, children, old, young, cattle, everything to be destroyed. What kind of God is this? Okay. So, um, so we've got we to we spend some time, at least at the front end here, kind of understanding why uh, this Jericho battle had to happen. So in Deuteronomy uh, chapter 9, a little bit of, a little bit of background here, uh, Moses said this to the Israelites, and this is before they um, went, to, went into the promised land and uh, the Canaanite conquest of which Jericho is the first battle. So Moses said this, After the Lord your God has driven them out before you, that is the Canaanites, do not say to yourself, The Lord has brought me here to take possession of this land because of my righteousness. Okay? No, it is on account of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord is going to drive them out before you. So Moses says, first of all, that you're going in to destroy Jericho and all of the Canaanite cities, not because of your righteousness, but because of their wickedness. All right? um, and so uh, in Canaan, which was a region of city-states with local kings, Uh, There was a deep, dark cancer at the time growing in that region for some 400 years at that point, okay? First of all, and two things primarily, okay, the deep, dark cancer. First of all, there was, uh, it was a a place of unrestrained sexuality. Unrestrained sexuality. Uh, America, in some ways, is a place of unrestrained sexuality in many ways, but in America, there's still some... Uh, things that are off limits sexually, right? America still believes, for example, that a grandfather should not act on his sexual desires for a granddaughter, things like that, okay? In Canaan, there was never a time when you should not act on your sexual impulses. In Canaan, acting on your sexual impulses was part of life. Okay, prove it. Leviticus 18, Moses gave the people a number of laws, gave the Israelite people a number of laws to live by as a new community, here's what he said. You would think that these things wouldn't need to be spoken, but they did. First of all, you should not have sex with your mother. You should not have sex with your stepmother, your sister, your aunt, your daughter-in-law, your brother's wife, uh, a mother and her daughter, grandchildren, a neighbor's wife. Uh, you should not have sex with a man as one does a woman. You should not have sex with an animal. Okay? 
Moses said, do not defile yourselves in any of these ways because <laughs> this is how the nations I am going to drive out before you became defiled. The Canaanites at the time were people you, who believed you should never restrain yourself sexually. Daughters, granddaughters, women, children, dogs, cats, grandmothers, okay? If, if, if you felt like having sex with it, you did, okay? And this was not, folks, some black market kind of behind-the-scenes activity of a few select perverts. This was Canaanite culture, okay? But this wasn't the worst of Canaanite culture. Uh, the second thing I want you to look at, uh, and, and again, in Deuteronomy 18, we get a picture of it, is the gods the Canaanites worship. Deuteronomy 18, verse 9, When you enter the land your, your, the Lord your God is giving you, do not learn to imitate the detestable ways of the nations. Let no one be found among you who sacrifices their son or daughter in the fire, who practices divination or sorcery, interprets omens, engages in witchcraft or casts spells, or who is a medium or a spiritist, or who consults the dead. Anyone who does these things is detestable to the Lord because of these same detestable practices. Their Lord, your God, will drive out the nations before you. So in Canaanite worship, folks, sorcerers, witches, mediums, spiritists would often encourage you to satisfy the anger of the gods by sacrificing your own son or daughter in the fire. And what that meant is you would place your crying baby on a bed of hot coals and watch him or her burn to death as they scream. So, so let me ask you, uh, how many burning children do you imagine you'd have to see to ask God to completely wipe out the place? One, this had been happening, folks, for hundreds of years in the region of Canaan. Okay. This is the why of Jericho. It's because of the evil of the nations. Does that make sense? Okay. So now let's talk about understanding the significance of Jericho. Okay. The Battle of Jericho is, a, is the first city that the Israelites conquered in the land of Canaan under the leadership of the Joshua. And, and the way the Jericho victory happened is a beautiful visual, I think, of what it means to live by faith. So about uh, about seven days before the Israelites uh, start walking around this city, Jericho was in a COVID quarantine. You didn't know that, did you? <laughs> no one left the city. No one went in. No one went out. All wore masks. Everyone stayed inside. I don't know about the masks deal, but uh, Jer Joshua 6.1 said, Now Jericho was securely shut up because of the children of Israel. No one went out. No one came in. Quarantine. There you go. And according to Joshua chapter 3, Jericho had just taken in the harvest for the season, which meant they had plenty of food inside. Uh, experts believe Jericho could have outlasted the Israelites for up to a year with their food and with their water because Jericho um, was located on the eastern border of Canaan directly on the banks of the Jordan River, uh, and it, so it was, it was built on a freshwater springs, which likely meant that Jericho had ample water supply within. Okay, so they could have outlasted the Israelites who knows how long, okay? And according to one preacher in his research, the city of Jericho was fortified by not just one wall, but two walls. The outer wall was six feet thick and 20 feet tall, and it was separated on the inside by 15 feet before a second wall 12 feet thick, 30 feet high. So Jericho was a fortified fortress. Okay? And from the outside looking in, this would be the hardest battle the Israelites would face because how do you get in there? Right? And then God gave Joshua some pretty strange instructions on how they were to take the city. Okay? March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. On the seventh day, march around it seven times, and then I'll have you yell and blow trumpets. Okay? That was the plan. So can you, <laughs> can you imagine the pre-battle, you know, briefing that Joshua would have had with his soldiers uh, after coming back and meeting with the Lord? So, you know, picture them. They're all in a large tent, right? And, uh, you know, they're uh, uh, sharpening their swords and they're mending their bows and they're maybe painting their faces and they're talking about the battle to come. And suddenly Joshua, the uh, army of the, uh, the general of the army, comes back from meeting with the Lord and they say, uh, General, they stand at attention. What's the plan? 
right? And Joshua says, okay, gather around. Here's the plan. On Monday morning, we're going to walk, we're going to, we, 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 along with seven priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant and trumpets, are going to march around the city of Jericho one time and go home. Like, uh, okay, uh, you know, we're going to kind of spy out the land a little bit. We're going to know what we're getting into, right? And then he said, what's, what's on day two? And he said, well, uh, okay, day two, uh, uh, Tuesday, we're going to, uh, us along with seven priests carrying trumpets on the Ark of the Covenant, uh, we're going to march around the city of Jericho one more time and come home. Uh, okay, so we're, we want to be thorough, right? So, okay, we can do that, Joshua. What else, okay? Uh, what happens on uh, the rest of the days? Well, same thing is going to happen on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Uh, okay, what happens on Sunday? Well, on Sunday, hear me out here. <laughs> we're going to march around the city of Jericho seven times, and after we've marched around the city seven times, the priests are going to blow the trumpets real loud, and we're going to shout real loud, and then... The two massively thick and tall stone walls will collapse before us and will go inside and kill everybody. And you would have heard crickets, right? I mean, you couldn't knock down a, uh, uh, you know, playing cards that way. And imagine the sight from inside of Jericho. Oh, look, Israel sent their marching band to play a halftime show for us, right? I mean, what is God doing? The Battle of Jericho, folks, is a beautiful world, word picture of the life that is lived by faith. Any army general or any military expert would tell you that there is absolutely no correlation between marching around a city for seven days, blowing trumpets, and the collapsing of a 12-foot wall. You could drive a thousand excavators around the city for seven days and the walls would not collapse. There is absolutely no correlation between what God had the Israelites do and the collapsing of the walls and the ultimate victory over Jer No correlation. And that's the point. Okay. The point is I'm bringing you into the promised land into the land I have promised you, but I want you to know from the start that all the obedient things I will call you to do along the way will contribute nothing to your entrance. Do you understand me? You are powerless to take the city as powerless as a high school marching band. You know, you want to humble a sports team, uh, tell them that they're going to win the game, but that none of the plays they will run in the game will have any contribution to the victory. Uh, so, Coach, we're going to win the game, right? But you're saying that none of our plays will have anything to do with it? Yes, that's right. Then why can't we just sit in the sidelines? Well, because you will know you have nothing to do with it, but they won't. Right? Folks, the lesson of the Battle of Jericho is that the people of God contribute nothing to their entrance into the promised land. God walk, knocks down the walls, period. Okay? And the idea, folks, that humanity could reach the promised land on their own is, that, is laughable. It's a joke. But many people believe so, right? I mean, they think, uh, they, they think of death and they say, well, I'm, I'm, I'm good enough. I'm not that bad. I'm not a bad person or anything. And they believe that the enemy of death, which Canaan represents or signifies, is beatable as long as they live a good enough life. And there are plenty of world religions out there that, tell, that will encourage this belief, right? If you're Hindu, this is what you believe. If you're Buddhist, this is what you believe. If you're Muslim, this is what you believe. If you're a New Ager, this is what you believe. Folks, nothing will bring um, your spirit to a quicker flattening like the awareness that you are impotent over your most formidable enemy unless the Lord collapses the walls for you. And that's the point. Okay. In this way, to walk by faith in the Lord and in the God of the Bible is to live life under the firm conviction that the Lord alone can give me power over the enemy of death in the end. I can't dance my way to eternal life. I can't perform my way to eternal life. I can't shout my way to eternal life. I can't march my way to eternal life, right? All of my earthly efforting and diligent do-gooding, although good and right and the only correct response to grace, right, all of my diligent do-gooding will in the end contribute nothing to my entrance into prom. There's no correlation. Okay? And either the Lord grants my victory and collapses the walls, or we don't get in. Okay? 
You see, faith in the God of the Bible calls us to consider the fact that all of our life's activity, apart from his power and his might and his promise, amount to nothing more than marching around the city seven times expecting walls to fall. A faith like this is total faith in God and zero faith in me. It is to laugh at our impotency and to marvel at his competency. It is to see ourselves apart from him as a bunch of fools marching around the city with paper kazoos expecting it to fall. Okay. So we talked about understanding the why of Jericho understanding the significance of Jericho. Now let's talk about understanding the two vistas of Jericho. Now what is a vista? A vista is a view or prospect, especially one seen through a long, narrow avenue or passage like a row of trees or houses. And the truth is you can see Jericho from two different vistas or vantage points in your life, and they're both very important. You can see Jericho from the east side of the Jordan River, or you can see Jericho from the west side of the Jordan River. Okay, so what does that mean? Most people only ever see the truth of Jericho from the west side of the Jordan River. What do I mean? Well, once you cross over to the west side of the Jordan River, you have entered the city limits of Jericho. And if metaphorically speaking, the land of Canaan, which includes the city of Jericho, since metaphorically speaking, the land of Canaan represents our final enemy, which is death, and all the spiritual forces of wickedness which, which work for death, the promised land represents that place that we shall one day inhabit as our own once God has kicked out the enemy of death. If this is Canaan's metaphorical significance, then almost everyone in the world sees Jericho from the western vista and very few see Jericho from the eastern. Let's talk about the western. The western vista of Jericho is experienced by anyone who's face to face with death. Death is on the other side of that wall. Okay. You're still marching, you're still alive, but you know you have maybe seven days left of marching before either death gets defeated for you or you get defeated, right? The Western Vista, everyone experiences on their deathbed. They are just about to either enter the promised land or not, okay? For everyone on their deathbed, they realize that no amount of faithful marching or skillful trumpet playing is going to conquer this enemy of death I've now reached, That's what we know on our deathbed, right? And believe it or not, there are some people who believe in Christ only ever, uh, those who who believe in Christ who only ever see Jericho from the Western Vista. They surrendered their life to Christ at one point some years ago, and they took that as their ticket that once I've crossed the Jordan and am face to face with the walls of Jericho and my life is at its end, God will at that point break down those walls for me and let me in. And since that time of initial surrender, they've not so much thought of God because they had the ticket in hand, why do I need to, right? Almost everyone, folks, sees Jericho from the western vista. Very few see Jericho from the eastern. So what's the eastern? The eastern vista is seen by those people who look to Jericho before they're anywhere close to it. I want you to consider Joshua chapter 5, the chapter before we read here. Verses 10 through 12, it says, On the evening of the 14th day of the month, while camped at Gilgal on the plains of Jericho, the Israelites celebrated the Passover. The day after the Passover, that very day, they ate some of the produce of the land, unleavened bread and roasted, and roasted grain. The manna stopped, stopped the day after they ate this food from the land. There was no longer any manna for the Israelites, but that year they ate the produce of Canaan. So this is very, very interesting to consider, okay? Manna, if you recall, is what God gave to the Israelites in the desert before they entered the promised land to sustain them in the desert, right? And if you know anything about manna, uh, the manna miraculously appeared appeared on the ground uh, when they woke up from their tents on the desert floor for 40 years. And it was just a sort of bread that appeared every morning with morning dew, with the morning dew. And you could not store it up. Like if you tried to store it up because you were afraid of not having enough in the future, it would disintegrate and become inedible overnight. So you had to trust God for new manna every morning because you couldn't stockpile it or freeze it. And think about it. How else would people living in the desert survive if not by this manna? Like the reason the desert was empty 
for the Israelites to live in the desert for 40 years and not be harassed by any people is because the desert's unlivable. People didn't live in the desert because people couldn't live in the desert, right? So d daily manna was God's miraculous provision for them for 40 years. And listen to verse 12 again. The manna stopped the day after they ate this food from the land. There was no longer any manna for the Israelites, but that year they ate the produce of Canaan. So once the Israelites crossed the Jordan and were now on the western side of it, manna never again appeared, and they began to eat the luscious produce of the land. So here's what this means. People who see Jericho from the eastern side are those who have learned that I do not just need God to get me over the wall of death when I'm on my deathbed. Eastern Vista people have learned through the course of their life that I need God in aching, every waking day. I don't just need help over the wall in the end. I need help out of bed in the morning. God does not just provide me eternal home in a promised land. He provides me my daily bread. And if he does not, I die in this desert. Okay. And for this reason, folks, Eastern Vista people get to Jericho. When they get to the Jericho wall, they're not afraid. You know why? Because they say, God has miraculously provided for me all the days of my life through no effort of my own. It just appears. Is it a hard thing to imagine that he'll get me over this wall now too? People who only see Jericho from the Western view are terrified when death approaches because for the first time in their life, they're trying to live by faith. And folks, we do not learn to live by faith on our deathbed. We learn to live by faith in the desert eating manna. Amen. Folks, and this transforms the way we think about walking by faith in this by faith series. If walking by faith means to you that, uh, uh, if all walking by faith means to you is that if you believe in Jesus one day, God will break down the walls of death for you and, and enter you into the, if that's what you think walking by faith is, you'll be in fear of death all your life. But if walking by faith means waking every morning, confessing, Lord, if when I get out of the door this morning, you do not provide for me your rich and miraculous manna from heaven to sustain me in the hours of this day, I will die here in this desert today. It is to say, Lord, this land is unlivable without you. I depend on you. I need you every hour. A person who lives their life in daily dependence on God like this approaches death with excitement, not fear. They know that death is the entrance into the oneness they've been longing for all their lives already. Furthermore, those who have learned to depend on God for daily manna find that this desert called life is not just livable, sometimes it's actually enjoyable. Because you don't have to stockpile. But those who do not learn this daily dependence on God, but rather learn to depend on themselves or their finances or their jobs or their ability or something else, ultimately find that this desert in life is more than they can bear. And the reason it's more than they can bear is either because they do not have access to his daily manna or they do, but because of a lack of faith, they fear God may not provide it for them again tomorrow. All right, so we talk about understanding the why of Jericho. It's not just a mean God trying to be mean, okay? We talked about the under, understanding the significance of Jericho. <clears throat> the wall's too big for you. That's the point, <laughs> okay? Uh, and then we talked about understanding the two vistas of Jericho. The western vista as you stand at the wall of your own death, usually terrified, and the eastern vista as you gaze at Jericho all of your life, confidently expecting that just as God miraculously provides for you every day, so when the wall comes, you'll get over that too. And let's close with this. Understanding the final application of Jericho. So the manna that God sent down from heaven in the desert appeared in such plenteous quantity that every Israelite could eat their fill every day. So I didn't need to, you know, scour the land and kind of some secret hideouts where I can find some extra manna for myself. Everybody had enough manna for every day you could have your fill. And this is very important to know because some people feel like God's manna from heaven is only available to some. Others feel like God shows favoritism and provides manna in different quantities to different people. But the truth is, every Israelite got all they needed. No one went hungry. In John 6, John tells us, uh, Jesus tells us about the true bread from heaven. Do you remember this? Verse 30, the people said to Jesus, What sign will you give that we may see and believe you? What will you do? 
Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. So the people wanted a sign similar to the sign of the manna uh, to, to, to believe that, uh, that Jesus was God's uh, care or sent prophet over his people. And Jesus replied in verse 32, Very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. And then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go thirsty, hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Jesus puts a spin, folks, on, uh, on the manna in a way never hypothesized before. Five things. Jesus said, first of all, that the true bread from heaven gives life to the world. The true bread from heaven is that which sustains life in the world, but also gives fullness of life to the world. So Colossians chapter 1, right? It says, the Son, the Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created Things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created, created through him and for him. The Bible says Jesus, the bread of life, sustains the world. But Jesus does not just sustain the world, he provides fullness to the world. Jesus himself would say, I have come to give you life and give it to the full, right? So Jesus is the manna from heaven who gives life to the world abundantly. Secondly, Jesus says that since he is the bread of life come down from heaven, he who receives him shall never hunger or thirst again. So it's not just that there will always be enough manna. It's that the true manna that came down from heaven is manna that takes away your hunger and thirst. The first manna, you, could not, you couldn't do that. If you chose not to eat the manna that day, guess what? You went hungry. He who eats of Jesus will never hunger or thirst again. Thirdly, Jesus said, there's enough of this manna to go around such that one does not have to scour the land to find your fill. Verse 40, for my, for my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise him up to life. Everyone who looks for the manna, there it shall be for him. There's not a limited supply available for only the best marchers. There's plenty. Fourthly, by eating this manna, Jesus said the walls of Jericho will one day fall. Verse 48, I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this will live forever. Whoever eats this will get over the wall. The wall will come down, however you want to say it, right? Amen. Now, lastly, Jesus said this. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in, in them. Just as a living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. Jesus said that he lives because of the living Father. Jesus did not live because he had food or shelter or clothing. He lived because of the living Father. Okay? In the same way, Jesus said that for us to truly live is not to keep the heart pumping. It is to abide in the one who is himself living. It is to abide in the living one. Just as the living Father sent me and I live because of the living Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because I am life. Right? True life, true abundant life here in this desert is not seen in how much manna you can pick up off the ground and digest. True life is found in, lear in, in learning to daily abide in the one who came as the bread of life and to seek to feast on him more and more. If the things you are putting your hands to in this life right now are not satisfying you, good. They aren't living. They can't. Your satisfaction will only come from the living one who himself has life because of the living Father and the living Spirit and the three in one, right? Jesus is the true manna from heaven, which if a man eats will never die again. So what does it mean to eat Jesus? Sounds rather cannibalistic, doesn't it? It is to walk out of your tent each morning, picking him up for your daily sustenance, never fearing that suddenly he will not be there one day for you to pick him up. So 
So what are some daily practices of picking up Jesus? First of all, get out of bed and fall out of bed and say, Jesus, unless you put your sustenance in my hands, I cannot eat today. You depend on him, not what he gives you. You stay in daily communion with him. Every time the fear comes of not having enough, of, not be, of him not being there, you voice that out loud. God, I'm afraid right now. Please give me your manna. Feed me. Remind me. Okay? Stay in communion, deep communion and connection with those that are also in this desert. It's hard. right? Stay in fellowship with those who understand the battle. There's just three things you can do. As we prepare to surround communion again today, let me, uh, and, and to take of Jesus' figurative body and blood, let me ask you, have you been trying to mightily march around Jericho thinking that your activity in this life has some correlation to the walls of death falling down one day? It doesn't. Do you see now that only Jesus can break down those walls and that what you most need is to depend on Jesus and not try harder. Have you imagined faith only from the west side of the Jordan? Have you thought God was just somehow, was just someone that you turned to at the end of your life when death was fast approaching? Do you see now that east of the Jordan is really where faith happens? Have you learned to depend on Jesus every day for your daily manna, or are you functioning out of your own power, anxious every day if there will be enough power to live on tomorrow? Do you believe that Jesus, our heavenly manna, is the only food that does not leave you hungry again? Do you believe there is enough of him to go around even for you? Have you lived in fear that one day you will wake up and there will be not enough Jesus for you to have? Do you see now that he provides abundantly for any who would come? Is it time to come and taste and see that the Lord is good? What is your next step? Maybe your next step is just to confess uh, to the Lord that you have doubted his ability to provide for you every day. Maybe your next step is to finally take and eat of him, to confess your belief in him today. We have one baptism already that will do it the lake, but maybe it's time for you as well. What is your next step of faith? As the as Don plays, we're going to form two lines, and I'll be standing to the right, and Maureen will be over here to the left if you'd rather talk to a female. What's your next step? Let's stand and let's commune together.